I am sitting on top of one of Humboldt County's historical wonders, a World War II relic. It's an underground bunker that was built over 80 years ago to protect ammunition and other supplies from bombing attack. Oh, and, and this isn't the only one. There's at least five others in this area. And who knows, as I start exploring, maybe I'll find even more. And later on, we'll be hearing from a local historian of some fascinating details about these bunkers. And it's all happening right here on Humboldt Outdoors. <laughs> You know, before we start exploring these bunkers, let's explore the mindset of the people who lived in Humboldt County in the early days of World War II, before these bunkers were even built. And to do that, we need to use a little bit of imagination. All right, so let's imagine that I have a grandfather who was a reporter for the Humboldt Times during the war years, and he was giving a report of a blackout that was occurring in Eureka on December 8th, 1941, which actually did happen. <laughs> and that also happens to be the same day that the United States declared war on Japan after Pearl Harbor was bombed the previous day. All right, you ready? Let's get that imagination going. Humboldt Times reporting from Eureka. A blackout order is now in effect by military order. There's reports of a large squadron of enemy aircraft approaching this area after being turned away from San Francisco's coastal defenses. Follow the blackout orders implicitly. Any light that is seen from the aircraft above will be a target and will be bombed. Panic was real and panic was widespread and the San Francisco papers were reporting how a massive fleet of Japanese planes had been turned away by the American fighters. None of that was true. They weren't Japanese planes for 3,000 miles. They were heading back to Japan on their aircraft carriers. But, um, but that happened and then because of that folks up here here on the radio read in the papers that you know oh my god if they were up there and then suddenly people start hearing things and locally here blackouts were imposed almost immediately people were terrified there were reports in the humble paper about um i think it was three japanese planes flying up the eel river valley you know past ferndale and there were absolutely no japanese mass air attacks on california no japanese aircraft carrier came within well, closer than Pearl Harbor during the entire war. And from December 7th onward, they weren't even closer than Midway, as we all know, you know, a few months later. War has come to the shores of Humboldt County, approximately 30 miles south of Humboldt Bay. And an enemy submarine attacked and torpedoed an American tanker ship, the SS Amedio. We have reports that 31 survivors were picked up by a rescue ship from their lifeboat and they were transported to Eureka. At this point, we have no word whether this is the precursor to yet more attacks or even an invasion of our coastline. Japanese submarines were, in fact, prowling up and down the West Coast. And locally here, there were literal attacks by Japanese submarines in the immediate weeks after Pearl Harbor. So it was not a coordinated thing like, like a German wolf pack you would think of, partly because of the distance. They were a long ways from friendly territory, but these were all very capable uh, machines of war and with, you know, with capable crews and commanders. By the middle of 42, it was pretty much over. But again, for six months there, 
there were reasons to fear that there was a more coordinated and larger um, plot afoot to, um, to really invade the West Coast. Well, my imaginary grandfather may have tended a little bit to the uh, overly dramatic side, but you know, based on newspaper articles from that era, there were those who were more concerned than he, and those who were less concerned of attack or imminent invasion. But one thing we do know for sure, and that is the military was concerned enough to build these bunkers out here to protect their wartime supplies, ammunition, and other items. And the exploration of these bunkers is where we are heading next. I initially spent hours and hours researching these bunkers and I just couldn't find any specific information about them. Well, a local historian said that's probably because at the time these would have been a guarded military secret, part of an entire military base that would have been off limits, restricted area patrolled by armed sentries. Well, I finally hit information pay dirt when I strolled into the Humboldt Bay Maritime Museum where I met the curator who started by telling me why these bunkers were built in this particular location and about when they began to be used. The, the reason the bunkers were put where they are, one of the reasons is because they would be in the farthest away from human habitation in case there was a ca catastrophic explosion that took over everything. And two, because out in the sand dunes, they could hide it better. You build it, you cover it with sand, and it becomes a dune. It, it self-camouflaging kind of thing. And yes, because you had the Coast Guard station there, you had the Navy base, the blimps, that was the hub. So you, you want it close. You don't want it right next to you, but you want it close enough so that they could get their ammunition or a set of death charges when the, the blimps went on their patrol probably wouldn't have put anything in them until the first started the base open, which would have been in August of 1942 is when they actually opened up the base, started bringing the personnel in and started bringing the blimps in. Jeffrey explained that one of the main functions of the nearby airfield was to support blimps. And they would patrol off our coastline looking for enemy submarines or even incoming aircraft or ships. The nearby Coast Guard station was also an important part of our coastal defense. Well, then Jeffrey went on to tell me a little bit about what they stored in these bunkers. But mostly it was the, the blimps that patrolled the coast. And because that they were out looking for submarines, they had carried depth charges, mostly carried depth charges. However, they could carry small bombs too. One bunker would have had 100 pound depth charges. Another bunker may have 200 pound depth charges. Another bunker would have had 100 pound bombs. Another one, 200 pound bombs, but nothing bigger than 200 usually because we didn't have any planes in this area that could lug around anything that, that much bigger. And another historian at the museum said that he believed that classified documents were stored in these bunkers to protect them from bombing and spies. But I was especially interested in these concrete chimneys, and I found out these are actually a safety feature. One of the biggest problems with ammunition is that the powder can degrade and start self-combusting, and they will catch on fire 
and explode. What they figured out was if they could build a chimney into it, so where if there is a blast, any explosions will go straight up and out. This way it's vented out and, and much safer. Jeffrey explained that if there was an explosion in this bunker and it didn't have the venting chimney, it would create a huge crater here and, and send dangerous concrete shrapnel flying out in all directions. The other safety features he said were built into these was they had water lines and they could actually turn on valves from the outside in case a fire broke out inside and completely flood the compartment. They also had routine inspections multiple times a day. And these bunkers weren't designed just for aerial bombardment protection. They were also designed to protect the contents from other type of bombing and artillery. Yes, the, these bunkers, not only were they designed to stop bombs from falling from the air, but they're also designed to withstand shells coming from a ship off the shore. Or, or a submarine, but at that time of thinking, it would have been a, a surface ship coming in to, you know, to land their troops. One of the first things they'd want to fire on is your ammunition and get rid of it. These bunkers were built with really thick concrete and sand on top to cushion the impact from any bombs or artillery. The design standards of the day were also to space them apart so that if there was explosions in one, it would not carry over to another one of the bunkers. So, what happened to these bunkers after the war ended in 1945? Let's find out. Okay, our bunkers were never never attacked. They were never shelled or, or bombed um, or had any mishaps that we know of. But after the war, they would have de decommissioned the station and sold off the property. And then after that, it became a hangout for, for kids and people that they could party and drink. And at one point, BLM came in and started closing them down, locking them up, welding them together, things like that, because people would just keep breaking into them. I asked Jeffrey, you know, why weren't these bunkers just demolished after they were no longer needed? Well, he speculated that it would have been really expensive to do that. These bunkers were built to last. He felt that they would actually still be effective against World War II era ammunition even after 80 years of being here. So my guess is eventually the sand dunes will sort of creep in and bury these bunkers like what is happening with this one. And who knows, someday in the future, maybe only a few local historians will know that there's these intact bunkers buried underneath the sand dunes. Now, now that's a thought. Now I invite you to join me as I explore some of these bunkers a little more thoroughly. So Jake met me out here with his drone and we were able to find a total of nine bunkers and seven of them were of this design, which is a slot through the middle, which we assume must have been for trucks to back into to load and unload their ammunition. Now there's one thing that really made me wonder, wouldn't it have been easier to load and offload that heavy ammunition out of the back of the trucks if the door was in the back of the slot? Why on the side, which seems to me it would have been harder to load and unload? Well, I have kind of a wild theory. Perhaps they felt if this metal door was at the back of the slot, it would have been more vulnerable to attack either from a ground infantry units with bazookas that could blast it out or maybe even offshore artillery that could arc into the slot and blow out the door. So maybe they put it here on the side so it would be less vulnerable to attack. The other thing is the doors and all these bunkers have been welded shut. Some have told me for decades and I really wanted to see inside. Well, Jake and I did a little bit of exploring and we found these little vent holes at the base of the doors on some of these bunkers. Jake came up with a great idea of affixing a GoPro camera onto a telescopic pole and putting it through that little access vent. Well, we did that. And I am going to show you some of the footage. Keep in mind, this could be the first anybody has seen inside these bunkers, perhaps in decades.
There were several things I was surprised about after seeing that footage. First off, the fact that there's only one chamber behind this one door. All the rest of this bunker presumably is just dirt all around it. The second thing was, those bunkers are still solid inside. We didn't see any evidence of anything had collapsed inside the bunkers. And as I mentioned before, there were seven of this style. And now let me go show you the two of the other style we found out here. We found two of this style of bunker. As you can see, they're much larger than the other ones. There's no truck slot. The door is easily accessible from this big wall. And these are the ones with the venting chimney mounted on top, which tells us perhaps that this was a bunker where they would store the depth charges and the big bombs that Jeffrey was telling us about. Now we're going to head over to one last bunker. It's the other large one. We're going to go up on top. These bunkers are now an historical site in the Samoa Dunes Recreation Area, and they are easily accessed from a day-use parking area at the end of Bunker Road. If you do come out here to explore, be careful. If you're climbing around on top of some of these bunkers, there are sheer drops down these concrete vertical walls. Some of them are obscured by brush. Also, there's an off-highway vehicle track that winds its way through some of the bunkers, so you gotta watch out for dirt bikes that might be coming around some blind corners. But the great news is, you can safely climb right on top of the largest bunker of them all via this boardwalk, which leads directly to the parking area. It also has some very informative interpretive panels and great views of just about all the bunkers in this complex. I would recommend you also make time to explore more of the Samoa Dunes Recreation Area. It is yet another one of the historical and natural treasures we have right here in Humboldt. Outdoors. <music>